disregard females and acquire currency. I'm white and I've got everything I need. No one clutches their purses when they're in a room alone with me. And I can drive for any neighborhood I please. At any hour, and the police don't do a thing. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got everything I need. I'm a guy getting paid more than a girl with a degree. And I can walk down the streets after dark, no one wants to rape me. And I can get a girl pregnant and just as easily flee. Just like my straight white male dad did to me. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got all the luck I need. I've got a pile of broken mirrors and I'm walking under ladders and I'm spilling tons of salt, but to me that doesn't matter because my skin and my gender and my orientation are the best things to have if you live in this nation. I recommend it highly. A penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Shit's gonna work out for me Cause I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Hey everybody, welcome to the Intellectual Dollar Tree. We do the show live every Wednesday right here on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. You can support this project. Just go to ecoplexmedia.com, click the support tab, find your favorite way. Uh, I'm producer Dave and you can find me on Grinder. And look who's here. Hey everybody, you probably haven't, uh, you've probably forgotten what I looked like, uh, but I am historian Matt. I haven't been on here for a very long time. Um, you can find me, well, actually you can probably, you can find me on Mastodon on, uh, port87.social as I think his Matt, I think it's just his Matt, uh, at his Matt. Um, you can probably find me in some other places, but I'm not going to tell you anything about that. And, uh, I've totally forgotten like everything about what I'm supposed to do on the show. So <laughs> <laughs> forgive me. I don't remember what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> oh, that's okay. You're. You're, you're on because you say things that are different than the things that I might yes. say, so that's okay. So before we get started here, you sent me this link. It's an Ice Coffee Hour uh, video with uh, Kevin O'Leary. Who is Kevin O'Leary? So for people who don't know, Kevin O'Leary is a guy from Shark Tank. He's one of the sharks, right? <laughs> the quote sharks. Uh, I don't remember. They might go over it in this uh, video on like how he made his money, but he made like a billion dollars selling some tech company somewhere. And now he's like supposedly some entrepreneur type guy. Uh, he also has, as far as I can tell, he's given himself the name Mr. Wonderful, which <laughs> makes no sense because there's just nothing about him that's wonderful. And he tends to have very bad takes as we'll see in this video. <laughs> you know, Mr. Wonderful is like a name that like somebody else should maybe call you after you've like done a good sex for them, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he gave it to himself, but you, you technically never... I, haven't, I haven't actually looked up how he got the name, uh, if anything, but yeah, it doesn't fit. Generally, generally, you just avoid giving yourself a nickname anyway. I know I force everybody to give themselves a nickname on this show, but that's my fault, yeah. not yours. <laughs> So that's a little bit different. <laughs> that's, that's my fault. So I yeah. guess without any further ado, here is ice coffee hour. Uh, the biggest myth about money that keeps you poor. I love their little thumbnails too, because it's basically that it's just them looking confused every time. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hobby that eventually should be taken behind the barn. and. I'm the 
only shark that tells the truth and I'm your best friend because your idea does suck it's going to zero and you're not going to waste your time on it any longer if you have the skills you have the desire you have the interest and you have the ability to execute within years you'll be wealthy AI is just another tool set and way overhyped it's like the internet was in the you know early 90s where people are underserved in America is the opportunity to get educated because that actually determines outcomes more than anything else what do you think the minimum wage should be I don't believe in a minimum wage I think the market decides being married is not easy. It's a total pain in the ass, but it beats the alternative. The one thing I would have changed in my life, if I could have, I would have. Yeah, I already started off pretty hot here. So it's on. They're on his podcast. No, this is the Ice Coffee Pod Hour podcast. Uh, I think when they say it's the Kevin O'Leary podcast, I think they mean this is Kevin O'Leary Leary episode. Oh, gotcha. Uh, okay. Yeah, but, but using confusing wording coffee hour we really really appreciate it so i'm curious we'll just start right off here because i know you're short on time who should not be an entrepreneur and when do you know when to give up about two-thirds of america should not be entrepreneurs and the, the reason you would know that is you you're unable to make the first step if you don't have um the ability to take risk, you'll never be a successful entrepreneur because I'll give you an example. In great business schools, I teach practically all of them. Almost half the class become consultants. They don't have the guts because think about a consultant. They never make any. I mean, that's not the reason why people, most people can't handle risk, but that's beside the point. Matt, why, why most, why can't most people handle uh, massive financial risk? I think it's because, you know, they don't have the finances, right? Like they're not getting paid enough to, do a side hustle or something or don't have enough savings because they don't make enough in their, their main job. I think that's probably the biggest issue. Right. Right. Uh, entrepreneurship actually like successful entrepreneurs often track pretty closely with people whose, uh, uh, family or friends have money. Yeah. So they, somebody to catch you when you fall is, uh, an important yep. thing for handling risk. Yep. You get paid a lot. It's great. If you go to the top of your consulting firm, maybe you make three, four million bucks a year. That's great. Can't complain about that. But every decision you make is just a consultation so that an executive who actually makes decisions, who's a real entrepreneur, can say yes or no to that idea. You're just making decisions of no consequence whatsoever. And the reason I don't hire consultants is after two years, they get that virus. They're just generating opinions. They're not doing anything. And I don't mean to insult consultants. I would just never hire them. And so if you really, you know, jump off and become- I think this is going to be a, a common thing in, his, uh, in this interview is he doesn't mean to insult anybody, but he's going to insult everybody. Also, I don't need any help. I know all the answers. It seems, yeah. it seems like, and I mean, that's fine. There's people who generally wouldn't hire consultants because they just want to you know, sink or swim on their own or- Actually, did you know that uh, people who run businesses oftentimes don't have money uh, to pay these consultants who make yeah. $4 million a year? Yeah, well, another reason that he didn't, I don't think he mentioned it yet, but, uh, or I don't know if he's going to, but one of the big reasons they hire consultants is so they have somebody to blame when they fire people. They say, oh, the consultant told me to do it. Right, and right. The consult consultant can be let go, right? And uh, move on to some other job. What was That's the, also why they get paid a lot. What was the name of that show about management consultants where they were like, that was a comedy sort of where the management consultants among themselves, like freely admitted that they were like con artists. <laughs> I forget what the name of the show was. It was very funny. I don't know. It sounds got, like one I want to watch. <laughs> if, if anybody remembers the name of the show, drop it in chat. I'll try to find it for you too. It's very funny. Yeah into a life of mediocrity. And I'm trying to define the difference between that life of mediocrity and one where that same graduate says, I'm going to take a chance. I'm 28 years old. I don't have a family yet. I'm going to start a business. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I have the ability to just take that risk, not seeing what's on the other side of the chasm. And I'm going to forego a salary of 200,000 a year because I want something more. Yeah. Those are the people who become free one day because they're, they're ma they make $5, 5 million dollars in a so, day. Uh, they're entrepreneurs. Pause it for a second. Um, not what he's talking about, but notice on his right wrist is a quite bright, garish uh, watch, um, along with his pretty bright phone there on the table. Uh, that might come up later. <laughs> oh, very nice. Also, this isn't like a big deal or a dig at these guys, but it's the iced coffee hour, and it appears that they're drinking uh, a warm beverage. Yeah. 
and water. <laughs> and that consultant that you use, <laughs> they're back enjoying their lives, but in, in a sea of mediocrity. Do you think you're born like that, though? Because it seems as though there is a, a personality type that's more prone to becoming an entrepreneur who really pushes back against rules, against authority, and they want to take a different path. I don't know if, it, if you're born that way. I think you have events that occur in your life that are jolting to you. And I, every entrepreneur I talk to that's been successful has that defining moment where they say, oh, I remember this moment in my life and I remember what happened to me and it, it just changed my direction. It, 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 it's like a meteorite in space. Knock it off course a fraction of an inch. A hundred years later, it's a billion miles in a different place. Well, that's the same thing with an entrepreneur early in their lives. For me, it was getting fired the first day I ever had a job. I realized that that was just somebody else had power over me. I, I couldn't even deal with it. Oh, I guess he's not so, so wonderful was, being fired in the first day in his job. All the hardships and everything else. But I wonder what he did to get fired the first day at his job. I think he might explain it, but <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't hope remember. so. I hope so. Very similar. There's some event that triggers somebody. So I'm not sure you're born with it. It's just something in your DNA says, I'm going to take that path of risk. What do you think is more important for a successful entrepreneur to be hungry for money? to be focused on profits, increasing revenue, decreasing expenses, or to be very passionate about the product or service that you're trying to sell? Well, if you're hungry for money, I guarantee you'll fail. 100%. If, if you start into entrepreneurship and on a journey and all you care about is getting rich, you will fail. You will fail miserably. Every entrepreneur, not some, every single one that achieved some massive liquidity event that I've talked to, and I've met many of them, they don't even remember you know, the day it happened, they just woke up and said, oh my goodness, I'm filthy rich. But they weren't calculating mm -hmm. for that. It, it's because they created something of such value that someone else said, well, we want to buy that business and you own whatever you owned of it. And you, that's what happened to me. I woke up one day and we sold the learning company for $4.2 billion. I was one of the founding members. I had founder shares. I wasn't even thinking about that the night, night before when we were negotiating the deal. And then the funny thing was when we all came back to the office, the 10 of us that were founders, we didn't know anything else except to go back to work. We didn't even know what to do. So the only difference was we were filthy rich. Now, over time, people changed sort of their momentum and, and their motivation but if you think that you you can calculate the exit and that somehow you can start a business because you know you're going to sell it, and make a lot of money, you will fail 100%. Mm. It's the second issue you talked about. It's the passion of loving what you do and getting up every day and working, willing to work 25 hours a day, eight days a week because you love it so much and you love to compete. That's how you become free. It's about not, not about the pursuit of capital. It's the pursuit that doesn't of sound like freedom to me. I mean, yeah. I mean, tw I mean, obviously he's like using more days and hours than, but if you're like working just always, that's like not freedom. I know like people do yeah. it because they think there's like a light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe where they'll like, that would be the idea, right? You work hard now so that you can enjoy your life later, but it doesn't seem like it. And, and, and maybe that's going to come up, but I'm not getting that vibe from this guy. Yeah. I mean, if you like, you're starting a company and you own a company, especially if you own quite a bit of the shares of the company, you have an incentive to work that hard, right? Um, and there's, there's enough stuff to do usually to, to work that hard. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's not freedom. You're, you're tied to the work for a while. Freedom, personal freedom. I don't have to work anymore. I work harder than I ever have. I really enjoy what I do. I love to compete. I love to do what we're doing right now, talking about this so that others may learn from my mistakes. But the whole idea is personal freedom. That is the American dream. And you have to set your course on that. And there's one attribute you need to pull that off. And I've taught so many people. It's the ability to differentiate the signal from the noise every minute of the day. People are going to chase you with stuff. You're going to get a thousand ideas. They're going to call you and ask you to do stuff. If it's not on task for the signal, it's noise. Hmm. It's noise. And you have to just push it aside. Those are the great yeah. entrepreneurs. They don't deal with the noise. Who are you competing against? It's when I start a business, for example, um, let's say watch insurance. I'm a big watch collector. I've looked at every all. single watch insurance watch insurance i've never like <laughs> i don't even understand like why people buy 
well, there's a time when I didn't understand why people bought any watches, but now like smart watches kind of make sense. But the, what they're talking about is these, uh, you know, basically like jewelry watches, you know, that are all mechanical type stuff. And I feel like they're kind of an anachronism now. I don't know how people get into this stuff. I mean, a, a nice watch looks good with a suit, but you know, you could get a watch that looks pretty good for like 80 or a hundred bucks, you know what I mean? Yeah, pretty much. They're not talking about the such cheap watches. <laughs> Those are for poor people. Yeah. Single policy there is for watches. None of them work for me. Why? The problem with watches, that if you go and get a, a rider on your home insurance, you know, you're going to notice when you actually read the FIDE print that you're going to end up in many cases with a depreciated value of the watch 10 years later when you lose it or it gets stolen or you or you break it. Except majority of watches these days go up in value and sometimes geometrically certain brands quadruple in value and and your your policy a decade later when that watch is out of production can't even contemplate its, its market value so i want a policy that actually scrapes market value every 24 hours and i can insure it for exactly what it'll cost to replace it and, or i can insure it for the purchase price i can decide myself right. but i'd much rather insure my watches for what they were worth last night. So I have a policy with Chubb and it's a stated value. And I've started doing this with cars too. Yeah. And I, I notice it becoming a lot more common, a stated value. And then if that watch gets lost or stolen, they replace that, I think, plus 50% up to the total policy amount. So let's say you have 100,000 in watches. Right. One of those watches is worth 20. You lose it, it gets stolen. They'll cover that up to 30 up to the total policy limit of 100 within a certain period of time. Okay, what happens if that's a, a steel white face Daytona that you bought for $12,000 that's now trading for 58? Well, then you do a, a stated value of, you know, and that eats 30 up, or 40. And that eats up how much of your of, of what you've got left for the other five? Whatever you say. Right. So for my five- But do people be losing just a watches? Like, this sounds like a fucking scam with watch insurance. Like, do people be yeah. like losing fancy watches all the time? What is it like the fucking like you remember in them old movies they'd be like oh there's a jeweler there's a jewelry thief in the fucking dinner party <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, it was the old movies where they have like con artists or something and they like you know they shake somebody's hand and steal, the, steal their watch or something at the same time <laughs> <laughs> fucking cartoon shit dude cartoon yeah shit. yeah <sighs> five watches i stated values in all of them and I stated the value based on what they're selling for on Chrono 24. Okay, so if so, I were to replace so I it, would rather there's be few my, policies like no, that. No, I get it. But yeah. I'd rather solve for a different problem. I have many watches. I only want to insure the 25 I travel with. And I want to travel maybe for a month with these to go shoot Shark Tank, for mm. example. I'm gonna, and I'm going to put them in a bank vault in LA. I want the value of every one of those watches that day should it get lost. And I want to be able to turn that policy off when I swap, swap it out for another 25 watches. Maybe I only have three watches. And I only want to wear one. It doesn't matter. I want a different kind of insurance product. There's nothing wrong with what you've mm. got, but it doesn't solve for me. If you think you're going to spend 1.72%, which is approximately what you're spending of the replacement value on your watches, I would want it to be accurate. I want to check the language regarding what theft is theft and what loss is loss, because I'm writing it specifically for watches. And lastly, does it work internationally? Because I travel a lot. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to thousands of people that are collectors of watches. Now I want to steal this guy's watch just to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. I know it's fucking grand theft and shit. If it's a $25,000 watch, it, I'd be screwed. But just to do it. <laughs> and they all want the same thing and they can't find it. There's nothing wrong with Chubb. There's nothing wrong with Lloyds of London. When you make something specific... For just watch owners, maybe you've made a better mousetrap. The biggest challenge the watch industry has in insurance is customer acquisition. I do not have that problem. There are millions of people who know I'm a watch collector. Mm -hmm. And when we tested this, I just put one 15 second ad out and got requests for 2000 policies. No insurance company's ever been able to do that. So I'm pretty calm. I don't know that. A year from now, after I've launched yeah. this product, I'll be a great competitor yeah. and I'll make this industry better by offering. I mean, not watch insurance, but I bet like any just random insurance company, like the big insurance companies get 2000 requests for policies in like six hours, like on a Tuesday. Like, what is he talking about? I mean, he's talking about starting a new insurance product and getting a lot of responses, which, uh, you know, makes sense, but, uh, whatever it's it's watches i don't i don't care step one really? already be famous yeah pretty much 
compete with. That's why I like to be a competitor. I see a hole in the market. I see a need. I see something that's required. I go pursue it. For a young entrepreneur, maybe trying to impress some investors or just a young motivated person that wants to get into watches, what type of watch would you recommend they get as their first watch? And what do you think is the most overrated watch company that exists? Although, you know what? Before we go into that, let's do- Ad break. Because minimizing your business is- Accounting. But you nope. From a businessman platform theory. Oh, that's what we is head to Nosh. I and let's get back to the podcast. For a young entrepreneur, maybe trying to Good impress timing. some investors or just a young motivated person that wants to get into watches. What time? Yeah, I was going to invest I, in I your company, but you don't have a fancy watch. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like, if I saw, if I was looking to invest in a company and the, the guy, the founder has like a super fancy watch. I'd be like, why do I want to invest in your company? <laughs> you don't seem to be good at like managing your money. <laughs> and you, you, that, that watch is $50,000. I just looked it up on eBay. You don't need my money. What you need to do is sell your watch. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> watch would you recommend they get as their first watch? And what do you think is the most overrated? Uh, a Casio calculator watch. Watch <laughs> that exists. That's a great question because I've said to people, um, countless times, never borrow money to buy a watch. A watch should mark a moment in your life as it has for me. I, I remember my very first watch, a Cartier Panther that I bought on my my first deal. You know, I think it cost me at that time $5,000. dollars blows my mind. Then was a fortune to me, but I, I, could, I was able to afford it because I closed the deal. The journey of watch collecting is actually a disease because you don't really need a watch anymore. You get better time off your phone. But because for men and for women too, it marks certain points in their life. I have a another watch that has on the back my first 500 million fund. I cherish that because, you know, that's not a lot anymore, but it was my what? first <laughs> when I got 500 million to manage. There it was. 500 million is watch. not not a lot anymore. Subscribers on it. Inflation's going back. crazy. Exactly. So, classic Rolex yeah. on the back. Yeah, see? A Two mile subscribers. Stick. Yeah. This was actually a gift from uh, a but subscriber. The point is you would never want to. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. One of this guy's subscribers bought him a fucking Rolex. Dude, I'm in the wrong game, baby. Seriously. I get excited like in the chat when somebody gifts out like 10 uh, subscriptions. Yeah. Or when somebody buys me like a light for my studio. <laughs> <Like> <laughs> Oh, gosh, never. Never. And, and and it's it's a very, very special piece that you will carry with pride for the rest of your life. And so every single watch I have has that. But the entry levels now, and I work with all the brands, people always you know call me up and say, why don't you endorse my brand? Why don't you wear only my watch? I'm a dial guy. I want to work with every watchmaker. I'm a member of the New York Chorological Society. I want to support watchmakers. And I support as a like a patron, new watchmakers like Simon Britt. I'm one of his biggest buyers because I love his work and he's got 10,000 people who want to buy his watches and he respects his collectors. I'm one of them. Here's some watches that I think are remarkable in terms of value and entry-level pricing. Two well, I forgot this is going to be the uh, watch show to begin with. This is so weird. Oh, wait, wait, wait. See his other wrist? He has another watch on it. That's weird. <laughs> and I think it's another like multi tens of thousand dollar watch. So like one watch, you're like, okay, this guy's old school and it looks good with his suit. Two watches, yeah. you're like, leave me alone. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do not talk to me at this here dinner party. The Tudor uh, Miami Pink, this is a $7,000 watch, but that Sorry. dial okay. is absolutely spectacular. It's beautiful. So Tudor has watches down to three and $4,000. And, and the quality of a tutor is remarkable. Grand Seiko. Mm -hmm. Spectacular. We were looking at this yesterday. Yep. Yeah, was it yesterday in Puerto Rico? Yeah. We walked in and the guy was talking nonstop about Grand Seiko and their movements are fantastic. It is the the most, Japanese really have it down for they, watches. They actually started making watches before the Swiss. The quality of a Grand Seiko piece is unbelievable. So if you're going to buy an entry-level watch... Like, I have look, no idea what they're talking about. Grand Seiko, Grand I'm sorry, uh, $3,000 is not an entry-level watch. <laughs> yeah if i'm gonna buy an entry-level watch i'm gonna buy it at the fucking dollar store <laughs> you're like a casio right is an entry-level remember uh the g-shocks that's that's about the extent of what i would have oh, ever spent on a watch <laughs> they go right 
There's a difference. Grand Seiko is extremely affordable. And they make some amazing pieces. And those are two brands that I feel, you know, Longines for women is a fantastic brand. I and mean, I support them all and I own them all. I, I mean, I'm a dial guy. It doesn't matter to me. I mean, look, this is a loose Patek. It's covered in diamonds. It's a really expensive piece. That's not why I bought it. I bought That's it. That's why you it's bought got it. got a beautiful red band, yeah. which is my signature mm -hmm. look. But also the dial is spectacular. It's a crazy But now I would argue for entrepreneurs, they want something that's recognizable where the average person on the street looks at a watch and says, that person is successful because they have that watch. I think Rolex is really the only brand that has <laughs> the that. The entrepreneur, what are they talking about? Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I couldn't imagine like going to ask some ghoul like Mark Andreessen or David Sachs for money and just being concerned if they, if, if they like, like my watch. Yeah. Like, I would hope they would not be looking for that or looking for having a reasonable watch if you have one at all. Right. Or <clears throat> they're like, oh, I, uh, you know, you find out maybe, are they a big investor in Apple? Yeah. <laughs> and then you wear an Apple watch. Yeah. Like, I don't know, though. Like, what? this is so crazy because I don't think this just seems like a very old, like, version of what it means to be uh, wealthy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause so I feel like these, uh, these kind of watches to me are kind of a, an anachronism. They're, you know, an object out of time, something you had in the past, but this is not really a thing to me. It's not even a thing anymore. A friend of mine has a Rolex, but it's like his dad's old watch and he got it when his dad yeah. passed away and it has sentimental value for him. And I don't think he's ever looked up how much the fucking watch is worth. Right. Cause yeah. I, I don't think he cares. Right. You might my, want to get watch insurance. My dad still wears a watch, but I, I, I would, I would be shocked if he pays over a hundred dollars for his watches. <laughs> my dad wears a watch, but he wears an Apple watch. Name recognition where if you're going into a meeting, uh, unless you're watch, like watch people know Grand Seiko, they know Tudor, but non-watch people, I think had the respect for Rolex as a brand of like, oh, they must be successful because they have a, a Rolex Submariner. But who instance. you're trying to impress is like a bidding entrepreneur. Like you're trying to- It, it is well, true that Ro degree. Rolex yeah. is 40% of the market in that sense, but there are other brands. I would argue that Patek Philippe, if you talk about the horsemen of watches in terms of respect in a meeting, AP, Rolex, Patek Philippe, mm -hmm. they're well, well known. They are the three horsemen. But also there's some brands that have come up in the last decade that are remarkable. F.P. Journe. Even if you have all those watches, those are the F.P. Journe collectors. They want a Journe. Journe is the, a living Picasso of watchmaking. Everybody knows. This reminds me a little bit, just in in like in its in its tone of American Psycho and the business cards. <laughs> you, I, I see that definitely. It's just real. I could see him at the meeting, like just just thinking, "Oh my God, look at his look at that guy's watch. Oh no, yeah. look at that guy. His watch is better than my watch. I better pick <laughs> up the check." Which is exactly really worth way more. Everybody's trying to get any genre they can get. It's transcended a micro brand. It's transcended an ind independent brand. It's it's become a brand. And that, that happened. Mm. So watch collecting is really about, for me, it's styles. Um, but I love it. And it's a whole community of people. It, it opens stores all around the world for me. Royal families, uh, European leadership. Everybody loves watches. Last watch question, because we do have to move on. Which brand do you think is overrated? That's a really tough question because. <laughs> do you want me to say? Same time he's Hublot. asked. Hublot. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I get that, but Hublot has just come with some dials um, the last six months. You know, these brands go, they ebb and flow. Let me give you another example Richard Mill. That was the hottest, what hottest, the shit? hottest, hottest, hottest yeah. brand during the crypto craze. <laughs> That's the yeah, ugliest fucking thing I've ever seen. If I. If I saw that on somebody's wrist, I would notice it and I'd be like, what happened to your watch? And they'd be like, no, it's just <laughs> like this. I'm like, are you sure? Is there, is there supposed to be like a face over? <laughs> now exactly. I'm critiquing watches. Now I'm the psychopath. In Richard yep. Mills with crypto. And I could never wear one because they never were allowed on television. They were just too ostentatious. And then along comes their new Titanium 01. Thin, super stunning dial. And I am wearing that on Shark Tank Season 16. So there's a brand that I couldn't touch. Now, Wait, are there watches that they're just too hot for TV? I don't know. I swear he just well, said the they'd, never one... let that, he, they'd never let that on TV. What is he talking about? 
Well, the other one was like such a mess. It probably distracted the camera or something. <laughs> the cameraman just zooming in on this guy's watch the whole time going, what the fuck is that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I wouldn't take anybody seriously if they had that clown ass watch that they showed a minute ago. <laughs> um, iconic in terms of style with this super thin titanium watch. So you can say that about Hublot, but just you wait six months and, th and stuff happens. It's like talking about steel versus gold. Six, seven years ago, you nobody touched yellow gold. Now it's smoking hot. And just in Geneva a few weeks ago, the, the best of show was what Cartier did with the crash. A watch <laughs> and that's a Salvador Dali painting on your wrist. Skeleton <laughs> that's actually pretty cool. I would, I would, I would be like, I, if I saw that, I'd be like, that's a pretty dope watch, right? Yeah. Like, because it's like. <clears throat> it's like stylish in a way it's it's probably probably <laughs> i'm assuming it's a watch for women it's feminine yeah and uh yeah i would i would definitely compliment a lady on that watch i'd be like that's fucking rad yep but he went ballistic and that's cartier and mm -hmm. so that that's a brand that you may thought was jewelry now i'd say for fashion haute couture when you see what's going to be on style for the rest of this year you're, you're going to see a ton of cartier now going back to topics when it comes to business and entrepreneurship you talked about being comfortable enough to fire your mother what does that mean to you when you start a business <laughs> it means he's an asshole no <laughs> right, right. i mean if you hire your mom and then you gotta be like I mean, if you hire your mom, maybe it's she's retired, right? And you hire her because she's willing to work for cheap at the beginning or whatever to try to help you out. And then you go, hey, mom, actually, uh, you you don't need to stick around if you don't want to anymore. She'd go, thank God, honey. <laughs> yeah. This is work. I don't want to work. All right. This, this, this actually sucks, sweetie. So thank yeah. you. For number one, you start hiring employees. They're, they're, uh, they're on top of you. Your shareholders, your bankers, they're on top of you. On top of both of them are your customers. They're number one. They'll always be number one. You are at the bottom of the stack because even though you own the business and that's important and that's how you'll be free one day, from that point on, you, you, you are working for everybody above you. If you use nepotism in your business and they don't perform, that's hurting all of the rest of the stack. So if you have your mother and she can't perform and she's only on there because you want to put her on payroll for some reason and she doesn't deliver on her promise to the team, you got to take her up behind the barn. Shoot her. You got to shoot her. Wait, what? Because you're hurting. <laughs> you just go, hey, mom. Escalated kind of quickly there. You could go, hey, mom, this isn't working out the way I thought it would. Uh, but let me, you know, let me, let me, you know, let me try to refer you to somebody else where you're, you would be like, if mom needs a job or whatever, let me try to help you find yeah. like something that's going to be better for you. Or let me, is there something else you'd like to do at the company? Because what you're doing right now, I think, I think we're, we're not doing, you know, it's your mom, dude. What the fuck? Yeah. Business that matters the most, not you, not any one individual. If they're not team members, they're cancer. Surgery immediately gone. The minute they're not on mandate, gone. I learned this lesson a long time ago. You're either on board or you're not. It seems as though the trend is to be ruthless in business. Is there ever a time to show compassion in business? Or would you say for the most part, that's giving away something that you don't need to be giving away? Let's get back to, you know, behind the barn. No, no, no. There's, I, I'm very compassionate. I, I think great leaders are very compassionate. Great <laughs> managers are very compassionate. They understand people are human beings. But in business... It's Didn't very, you just negative, like very binary. You spend half this, uh, well, the first part of this uh, video insulting a bunch of people. Now he's saying uh, he's compassionate. Yeah. Like the other thing is like, if somebody's like not on task or whatever, <clears throat> like a good manager actually is able to get them back on task. It doesn't just, you don't just yeah. can them because turnover is expensive, especially for a small business. So, yeah. you know, you find out maybe, maybe you just find out that they're kind of feeling over overworked. A little bit stressed you go hey you know what if we what if we paid you a couple days what if we gave you a couple extra vacation days what if we you know what if you yeah. work four day week for a little while and we'll we'll check back in in a couple months see how you're, that's what a good manager does actually good yeah. manager tries there's, to keep good people there's any number of reasons why somebody might not be performing to their peak but uh and managers yeah a good manager is gonna you know try and help them out, try and help them out yeah try to figure out what's going on see what see see what they can do yeah. You either make money or you lose money. There's no in between. I mean, break even business is not sustainable. It's not going to work. You either make money or you lose money. Most companies can't last more than 36 months losing money because they can't raise any more if they go out of business. So you, you should understand what the goal is. 
And you know, people tell me all the time, well, shouldn't we have a social mission? Sure you should, as long as you can afford it. If you don't make money, you can't pay out any social mission. You can't support any charity because you're losing money. If you don't understand that, you're probably not going to make it because businesses, the DNA of a business is actually to make money. And lots of people say, well, no, it isn't. It's to say- I mean, unless you're a benefit um, corporation, but Yeah, I was just thinking they're a specific corporation as a specific type of corporation. Yeah, public benefit corporation. Yeah. Where the goal is sure to make money, but in, in the, the goal after the money is to do X, Y, or Z with the money. Yeah. Well, like benefit corporation, like their first mission is they have to be a benefit to the public period. Like it doesn't, right. it's even before like basically making money, but like if they're making money, but they're not a benefit to the, to, you know, society, then, uh, they shouldn't be around. Right. Or they, 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 they uh, ideally would lose that status. Right. Right. And they would just have to make it or break it as a regular corporation without any of the advantages that you get um, from the government for being a public benefit corporation. Yeah. Sure. Social cause that's actually called a charity. There's nothing wrong with that. You can't mix them up. I'm curious. How do you value your time? Although, you know what, while we're on this time, another commercial. the link down below in the description, oracle.com slash iced. Thank you so much to Oracle for sponsoring this episode and let's get back to the podcast. I'm we curious, are not sponsored by Oracle. In yeah, we're not sponsored by Oracle. <laughs> I wouldn't take their money. Fuck Larry Ellison. In the segment with Logan Paul and Impulsive, you were talking about an entrepreneur who came and was making $5 million a year from his business and his fiance was upset that he was not spending enough time with her. And you said, what's more replaceable, the business or her? Whoa! Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, you know what's replaceable is my guests. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, Again, Jesus. like, he has this name. Like, he's given him this na himself this name, Mr. Wonderful, but he does terrible things or says terrible things. <laughs> what a jackass. She, I guess, at the end of the day, was probably more replaceable. But how do you balance living life and enjoying things versus the pursuit of money? Well, you have to understand there's different phases in an entrepreneur's life. Um, there is no balance in the early days. And I think you're fooling yourself if you think there is, which is why I say you better love your idea. You better love your mission. You better love your product. You better love your customers because you're going to have to spend an enormous amount of energy on it and you're not going to have a balanced life. If you're successful, that's when you buy your freedom. And you can dial in your. I'm also like a little bit, a little bit off topic or whatever. I'm almost noticing this is a very nice house or something that I would never want to live in. <laughs> it just looks too sterile and not very yeah. much like a home, you know. Yeah, I mean, I haven't really been looking around that much, but yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm, I don't know if they say where the, where they're actually filming this, but oftentimes uh, Graham and Jack, who are the two guys that are interviewing, you know, run the ice coffee hour. They're flying all over the place and they're doing it in other people's homes and stuff. I don't know if this is uh, Mr. O'Leary's house or not. I, I would guess that it might be. Yeah. Looks like it could be. Uh, check the, check the, check the, uh, the check the, the floor for like uh, blood residue. Business by <laughs> hiring more people that can execute for you. I'm a very fortunate guy today. I can do whatever I want, but I, it doesn't mean I didn't work like hell for it. I did. But now I, I pursue things that really matter to me. I think there is a balance in life that you earn and you need it because you have to have the yin and yang. It's a marble all top you table. On it. Day, you will not I wonder if they're sitting at like the island thing in a kitchen. <laughs> I don't it's know. Like it. it. It's a, the table seems a little high, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not an interior designer. You really, really have to balance it. You'll be creative when you have the yin and yang of chaos of art. And let me give you some examples. I love to learn from other successful entrepreneurs. I, I did a, a guest stint with Michael Rubin uh, from Fanatics, very successful entrepreneur in sports. He was a guest shark and I was working with him and he said a few times, how big can this be when he was being pitched deals? And I really liked that about him because he wasn't thinking small. He said, if I'm going to burn my time, it's got to be big. It may be very competitive, but it's got to be big. And I re and you know, great about Shark Tank, you meet these wonderful people and you have lunch with them and hang out and do everything else. 
Doesn't sound like a wonderful person. Really stuck in my mind. So I'm learning. I'm always learning from other entrepreneurs. That's one guy. How big can it be? Just think about how important that is to ask mm-hmm. yourself in every opportunity you see. And the other one, Elon Musk, he hates wasting time. If you're engaged in a Oh, campaign, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> he wastes time all the time. He's constantly on Twitter posting bullshit. Yeah, yeah. It's like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> with him. And he thinks it's useless information. He'll just walk away. He doesn't care about the social impact of that. That's why he's so wildly successful. Yeah, sure. And so you got to think about that. I've seen him do that. And so it's people feel nervous meeting him maybe and they want to make small talk. That's not what he wants. What do you know that's useful information? That's what he wants. Yeah. When does it become unhealthy? Sure. Uh, I want to give the example back in really from 2020 to 2023. I was in a phase where all I cared about were what I'm doing every like hour of the day. And I calculate the value of my time for an hour. And if someone were to say, let's go and grab lunch, let's go and grab a coffee, I would calculate how much that time is worth and then think to myself, do I want to pay this amount to go and have coffee with this person? And I got to- Okay, if you're thinking that, then that person should find somebody else to go to fucking coffee with anyway, because now you're wasting their time because you're an yeah. asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> point where like almost everything it just nothing made sense for me to do other than work because my time was so valuable during those certain hours but also yeah. as a secondary example graham and i we were considering getting a hotel room together or separate <laughs> and graham was running the calculation of the cost per hour that he would have to pay if we got separate rooms and is it worth that premium and i think about the other you know stuff it's like okay well we'd have separate bathrooms maybe we get a better <laughs> night of sleep maybe this and he's still calculating this and this was probably four or five months ago That's and he true, has yeah. plenty of money now so at what level do you <laughs> think it becomes counterproductive wait it, does this other guy not have any money what the fuck's going on here jack is like this is his only a major youtube video thing that he does hmm. um and i don't even know how much of a cut he takes even though he basically does everything for uh, ice coffee hour show becomes counterproductive. <laughs> I'd say you, you you've yet. reached Nirvana. All right, that was actually how you should operate. There's no question because when when you have enough capital and you can start to say to yourself, "Well, I'm going to fly first class now because I've I've earned it for myself." But you earned it for yourself. You didn't borrow money to fly first class. In the beginning, we used points for everybody. We were in the back of the bus everywhere. Now, ooh, ooh like, maybe you don't maybe don't say that. Out of Europe tonight. Yeah, <laughs> not quite the right I, words. I, I, I earned it. I earned it. But I can afford to do that. But I am the same as you. I break my day into 30 minute segments. And I'm always looking with, you know, with the people that schedule me. What's this? What's this thing in the schedule? What is that? Why am I doing that? What am I going to get from that that's either of interest to me that I'll learn something or is going to help one of our businesses, of which there are now 54? Why am I doing that? What the fuck? It's, oh, you well, have 54 no. businesses. Jesus Christ. He has uh, um, investments in 54 businesses. Jeez, what a fucking monster. I wouldn't really say, like, I have 54 businesses. He's a monster, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> They called up. They said they knew you. And I'll say, well, I, I don't know why I would use my most valuable asset as my time. That's what you said earlier. Mm-hmm. You're right. It is your most valuable asset. Now, when you use it for your family, there's that's very valuable. But when you waste it, that is a crime because you'll never yeah. get it back. But when is it counterproductive? Because there are some things where I will deliberate for maybe 30 minutes price matching to save $50. And then I go through this other phase where it's my time is worth more than $50 and the time spent deliberating. I may as well just paid more. But then I feel internally that he doesn't like getting ripped off. I don't like, yeah, I like getting a good deal. And so when I think I'm overspending, I feel like I'm getting ripped off in a sense. And I I looked at myself. Graham, who's speaking like right now, he's like, he kind of drives me crazy. Do you know his like other channel, not this one, but his like main channel has like, it's over 4 million subscribers. <laughs> like he's not hurting for money for income. He doesn't need to think about this stuff. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I mean, I'm not, you know, wealthy by any means. And I, I don't obsess this much about getting the best deal on everything. Yeah. I just like, is this, you know, if I, like if I buy something, for example, for the studio, like I actually learned a lesson. Um, I bought uh, cheap lights 
and uh, because yeah. I thought I was getting the, the best deal. And uh, no, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> not so much. Spent more. Should have spent more. Yeah, yeah. Should have bought lights so that maybe had a RGB a W, so that I had a no. proper white light. <laughs> but whatever. Right. I'm thinking ten years ago, me would look at this and and not want to get ripped off. I think that's a very good instinct. I don't think you should ever give up on that. I I you know people ask me all the time. You just bought that watch for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Why would you spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars on that watch? And I argue, and I have the empirical data to show it, that that is probably a better investment than putting it in the S&P 500 because that piece is a piece unique and in 10 years will be worth materially more. And I'm making that calculated risk as an alternative asset. I actually have on my balance sheet in my portfolio <clears throat> mark-to-market value on every single watch because I don't want to get ripped off. I wow. mark-to-market every 24 hours the value of every piece. And I know that that's, uh, you know- And then he accidentally drops into the toilet. I can look at, he has insurance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that I study like watches and know when it's a bad purchase and I won't do it. So it's sort of keeping that in your DNA. He's talking about like a life changing amount of money for most people. Yeah. And just being like, well, it seems like a good thing to spend on a watch because it'll go up in value. Right. It's a good thing. I don't know why crazy. it's a bad thing. Yeah, he, he's like detached. This is the detachment from like just the everyday reality of people here is, is stunning. <clears throat> right. Like you contrast yeah. this with like Warren Buffett, like motherfucker, motherfucker drives a fucking Toyota Camry, dude. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're both parasites, but at least Warren Buffett, it, like in some ways, has some like understanding and attachment to reality. How many cars do you think? Oh, I bet this guy probably didn't even have a car. He's probably one of these guys that doesn't have a car and just has like calls a driver. Yeah, he has a car service. Right. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy, but not that, right. not the, not the, not the new, uh, the great reset version of it. Doesn't mean <laughs> that, you know, it's a bad investment. I think it's the, it's the value of, of your time versus the amount that you spend. Like even last night, the first thing I do when I look at a restaurant menu is the price. And then what it is second. And I'd rather get the item that's $18 and a better deal than the other one that I kind of want a little more if it's 25. But I feel like- what the, Well, you're crazy then. <laughs> yeah. That's like a $7 swing at a restaurant. Get the fuck out of here price for the yeah. fajita like i'd rather the mahi burger i'm 100 percent the same way <laughs> right. because i mean you know i also you should you should spend money on good food for your body because that actually makes you much more productive i don't eat crap food anymore none so it's it's you, you'll you'll see as you get older you realize your energy levels are so much different you know either you treat food as medicine or food or, or one day you'll be taking medicine because you ate shit food sure like that's really what happened it's bad i mean it's i mean outside of things like maybe diabetes diabetes or maybe like obesity that's probably not true actually like like a, a diseases most of them don't give a shit what you eat yeah i mean there's certain diseases related to like you said being overweight uh um or diabetes or something like that but yeah, I mean, food, like, if you're careful what you're eating, you can eat food that makes you feel better overall, like, but then again, the, the food doesn't taste that great, so you don't feel feel better eating it, right? I mean, there's a balance there, right? Obviously. Yeah. True. What you're putting in your body. Why do you like making money so much? I don't need more money. I just like, the only- Why do you like business. making money? <laughs> He's like, I want to make- I want to make money, make a bunch of money so I can go on here <clears throat> and function as uh, like a parasocial management consultant while I shit on management <laughs> consultants. Exactly. <laughs> Success in, in against competition is profitability. Uh, I'll run a business for three or four years. My wine business made no money for four years until we turned it profitable. And now it's wildly successful because we now ship direct to consumer in 48 states. I think I ship uh, 2.7 million bottles a year. I figured that business out and I don't know p many people that ship that many bottles. But his wine is so mid. I'm competing and I'm winning and <laughs> Probably. I'm making money and I'm building a great team in wine and I enjoy wine. If you're not making money, what are you doing? You're, you're, it's a hobby. It's okay if you want to call it a hobby, but if you're actually burning hours, and we've been talking about time, yeah. burning hours and making no money, why would you do that? 
unless it's a hobby. Otherwise, you're just a loser. Now, what about Wait, when it what? comes to body language? Uh, back to the Impulsive podcast. You said that there's some downtime when you're filming Shark Tank, where cameras will come in, get B-roll, and the contestants are just standing there. And you said that you could tell from their body language how confident they are. and if they're gonna Ooh, be- body language. Yeah. I, I don't know. Oh, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to see those body language experts that we were watching for a while. Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Successful. And if they believe in the product, what do you look for specifically when it comes to body? Yeah, some people are just Mostly nervous, you know, right? Like <clears throat> they've, most of these people aren't used to being on TV and they're not already rich and they're there for an opportunity to get an investment in something they'd, that they're passionate about. So right. their body language might be a little awkward. Like when the camera's right. not on. Yeah. They, if you stare at somebody, can they take it? I mean, you can stare at somebody. That has nothing to do with <laughs> four or five seconds and they just making money, make, so running a business. They're going to fail. This is just how you creep people out, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty They're like, oh, I hope, I hope one of them invests in my project and I hope it's not him. Exactly. Um, they got to have, they, they have to have in their head that moment before they're even talking. I am here for a reason. I've earned my way here. I'm really good at what I do. I'm going to deliver my message and nobody is going to trip me. That's the mentality you have to have. And you're going to get fried in there, even though you've practiced, you know, 50 times in front of a mirror. It's not the same from when the cameras are rolling and you've got all the sharks there and the dynamic that's going on. You have to be confident. And it's really in the eyes, I think. Um, that's because I'm, I'm right almost 99% of the time. That's a loser hasn't even said anything yet. Mm. Like, how would he know? Like, they just don't have, does he follow up on any of these people? No, he probably (laughs) doesn't. And he probably follows up on the people that he invests in, obviously, but people he doesn't invest in, he doesn't pay attention to. And he's like, Oh, that, that's a, that's a a loser. They have like the wrong look in their eye or whatever. It's like, dude, that's weird. You're weird. (laughs) Yeah. I can can just, just bust out a crystal ball at this point. (laughs) It takes, to drive, you know, there are winners and losers. Yeah. That's not my fault. It's just the way it is. And what about trusting your gut? Mm. Has that ever steered you the wrong way? Because you're very much lead by intuition and you kind of have a, a feeling if this is going to work out or not. You don't have gut till you failed a lot. The intuition or the gut feeling is experience. That's what it is. And so I always tell this famous story about my last year of business school. This guy came in the class, they, always in these MBA courses, they start bringing in guest lecturers. And he was came into the cohort that we were graduating a week later. And I was sitting beside a guy named Barry Nicole. It's no, he passed away. It's really unfortunate, but I'd spent two years beside him. And this guy walks in and he doesn't say anything. You know, the, 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 the lecturer introduces him and he just starts walking at the bottom of the pit. It's like Harvard. It's a case study, 168 people in the room. And he's just walked around and then he started walking up and down the aisles and it was really uncomfortable for everybody. Like, why is this guy not talking? And then he goes down to the bottom of the pit and he looks up and he says, you guys think you're such hot shit. You're going to graduate with your MBA. Aren't you smart? And you think you're going to go out and change the world. A third of you are going to fail in 36 months. You're going to get fired. A third of you are going to go into mediocrity as consultants. And a third of you are going to work like hell for 10 to 15 years and maybe make it as an entrepreneur. And I, <laughs> I leaned over to Barry and I whispered, this guy's a real asshole. And, and then I became him. <laughs> exactly. I'm that guy today. Yeah. I'm that guy. <laughs> he is right. He was 100% right. That's exactly what happened. He was 100% right. The arrogance you have when you're young, you've never felt the sting of failure is unbelievable. And only life can beat the crap out of you and make you have experience. That's the whole idea. And that's really what I learned. And now when I go in and I give that same lecture to people, it's out of experience. And so when I see deals now and I meet entrepreneurs or I'm offered to invest in stuff, I have a pretty good um, spider sense whether it's going to be successful That's or not. Do you think sense. it's better to tell them it's going to fail and just say your idea sucks, you're not confident, this is not going to work out? Or do you think it's better to let them fail and go through that experience so they could learn from it? Well, that's what I do all day. That's why I'm the hated shark. <laughs> I always say that idea sucks, it has no merit, it's going to go bankrupt, and you're going to lose your house. 
versus what Lori. <laughs> oh, thanks. Oh, <laughs> you keep going. I admire what you're doing. Uh, I'm not going to give you any money, but you just keep <laughs> on going. You go, girl. You go. I lean over to them. I say, what are you talking about? This idea is shit. It's going to zero for sure. It's disingenuous what you're doing. We have that debate all the time. And, and, you know, and I get the rap for being the guy that tells the truth. I'm the, I'm the only well, I mean, the problem the is he says it in an asshole way, right? Like you can tell people that you don't think their, their idea is going to work and not like shit on them. Right. You could say something like, Hey, you know, <clears throat> it seems like you're going to have to put a lot of your own personal capital in this, into this. Um, I don't, you know, see a lot of people uh, that are probably going to invest in your idea. And if you fail, like you have a wife and kids and a mortgage. You need to think about that a little bit yeah. before, before you can, before you go all in on this, that's the, uh, that's telling somebody that you think their idea is probably not great without being a dick. Yeah. Best friend, because your idea does suck. It's going to zero and you're not going to waste your time on it any longer. You'll start something else. That's the whole idea of entrepreneurship. Maybe you try three times. You only need one success. What time were you most surprised by the pitch where you thought, okay, this is horrible. You're going to lose your house, but then it ended up being a success and there was demand for that. Before we get into that, here's a funny story, guys. I for another ad. For some reason, have you ever seen dollars? It oh, you're in shit off in the web Yahoo Finance. There's a link down below in the description. Thank you so much, Yahoo Finance, for sponsoring this episode and back to the podcast. What time were you most surprised by the pitch where you thought, okay, this is horrible, you're gonna lose your house, but then it ended up being a success and there was demand for that? Base pause. I think it was 2020 or 2019. Anna Skya walks out, says, I have a cat DNA testing kit for $29. And I looked at her and said, I can buy a new cat for five bucks. Why would I spend $29 <laughs> on a DNA testing kit? What a stupid idea this is. She was so compelling. No one gave her done. So the same guy that spends like tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars on his watch is saying that he can go out and buy a five dollar cat <laughs> he right. doesn't understand <clears throat> and the reason that this uh <clears throat> worked is one it's got cats on it and so people are going to be attracted to the packaging even if they don't own a cat because we learned yeah. from the internet that people like cats the other thing is that that 30 dollars price point trying to if you're trying to figure out what kind of cat you have that's like kind of interesting if you are in interested yep. in your cat it's like 23 and meow which is what i would have called it but then i would have got <laughs> sued by the 23 and me people right Right. Uh, that actually would have been a good name. Right. right. <laughs> Not a bad name what they came up with. Also, yeah. I, but. you know, I wouldn't have necessarily, if I saw that and hadn't heard about it or whatever predicted, it would have been some big shit, but I'd have been like, oh, it's a pretty good fucking idea. People be doing DNA yeah. tests on themselves. Why not on their animals? See what kind of animal yeah. they got. I'm guessing this guy's never had a pet and he does not, because he does not seem to understand. $29 is not bad. And <clears throat> also he's like, well, you could just go out and buy a cat for $5 which is weird. <laughs> yeah, but you don't know what, you know, you don't know what his DNA is at that point. <laughs> I just thought, wow, this woman just does not stop. She is vicious. She is so focused on this idea that she can help cats live longer and that people care enough about their cats that they'll give them 29 bucks. I said, okay, I can't take it anymore. I'll give you, I'll give you the 250,000, whatever it was I gave her. And you I can't said, help I, it anymore. I, I, <laughs> that I, was oh, it? I couldn't take it. I mean, she was not going <laughs> to leave. 250 grand. Yeah. She was talking. not yeah. going to leave without a deal. And so I finally, I caved. Yeah. That was one of the, it was the highest IRR return in Shark Tank history. A matter of months later, she sold it to a giant pharmaceutical not because of the kits, because of the data. Right. She had the cat DNA data by the hundreds <laughs> of thousands. That's the most fucking stuff. American thing in the world. Like, oh shit, yep. we can fucking, we can sell data on your cat. Yeah. Invade the privacy of uh, Mr. Tinkles. <laughs> your cat. And now, now the cats are going to do a cat action lawsuit. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Tough. Wow. Even though you think you know, you don't know. That's why you got to invest in a whole bunch of deals because it's the ones that you think are going to be great that end up being you know, turds. And the ones that are just insane, like base paws. What about <laughs> Wicked Good Cupcakes? What a monster hit that was. Cupcakes in a jar, nobody would give them a dime. Tracy and Danny, it was 12 years ago. It was the same situation. They were so compelling with their whole pitch and their story, I thought, okay, this is, 
So this guy's saying basically that if you're a confidence man or confidence woman, that he'll give you money. Yeah, it sounds like it pretty much. Telling it, maybe someone else will like it too. Sold to Hickory Farms, huge hit, huge hit. Imagine putting a cupcake in a mason jar, shipping costs go up by three times. But that's not what their story was. It was. But nobody ships one cupcake to anyone. Yeah. Pretty well. I guess it goes up three times if you're doing a bunch of jars, but yeah, yeah. I still don't think jars are jars that heavy that I would. Uh, it seems like it would be still be a volume type shipping thing. Anyways, but I'm gonna go into the <clears throat> the jar is finances. way heavier than the fucking cupcake. But well, yeah. But I'm saying like when you ship something, you either ship by or pay by weight or pay by volume, and that's dependent on if something's you know dense and is very heavy, you pay by weight. But if it's you know big enough, not that dense, and you pay by volume. And I don't know if a jar is too heavy that you have to pay by weight. And not for nothing, the only cupcake I want is one that came out of the oven like five minutes ago, if we're being honest <laughs> That's true. Shifting. <laughs> and it was really, really... So I've, I've learned that you just don't know, and you've got to cu cut a, a lot of slack in these deals. Who knows what last year's crop's going to do in four years from yeah. now? Who knows what I'm going to see next week when we start again? That's why I have a lot of latitude. And I, I don't even have to like you. I just want to figure out, can you, well, I don't like you. Like Anna in base pause. She was a ferocious beast. Her, her past record of execution skills was insane. She just never fails. That's the other thing. 75% of the deals for me in 15 years have been the ones that were successful run by women. What's different about them that makes them more focused on profit or better business? Well, we actually studied this. We went back and looked at seven years of data trying to figure this out. And what we learned was that, you know, there's something to this adage. You want something done, give it to a busy mother because they juggle a lot of things in a small startup company. But yeah, you know, people who can't be entrepreneurs setting. I have a, I have a, I have a hypothesis actually. It's that <clears throat> it's because of sexism. So yeah, women who get the investment have to be better because of uh, assumptions that a lot of these old white guys have about men versus women as far as entrepreneur entrepreneurship and business. Uh, these attitudes are starting to change, but it it generally means that the <clears throat> that the the woman in doing the pitch has to yeah. have done so much more, and yeah, and have like a much more solid like foundation versus oh this guy reminds me of me when I was a kid, right? <laughs> so goals, growth goals that were attainable. So their average growth rate was only 17% versus the men in our portfolio, 30%. But they only hit their targets 65% of the time and women hit them 95% of the time. And I thought, why does that even matter in manifesting itself for a better cash outcome? And the answer is nobody wanted to quit the new, you know, the New England Patriots when Brady was the quarterback because they had a chance of getting a ring, a quarterback that just delivered the, you know, championship year. That doesn't really year. fit. His Super analogy doesn't fit. Super Bowls. So women entrepreneurs that set goals that everybody achieves, the culture gets very sticky and there's no attrition. There's no, nobody quits. Mm -hmm. And a small business, when you lose the head of sales, the head of accounting, head of logistics, very disruptive. That's sort of what the secret sauce was. So now we really reduce our growth targets to make sure we can achieve them. That's what matters. How important do you think a morning routine is? You've got <clears throat> quite the uh, early morning routine, right? You're, you're up at uh, four or 5 a.m.? No, I got up this morning at five. Okay. I went down to the gym. I listened to um, three or four European feeds while I was working out, did some aerobics, did some weights. It's a constant routine. You need that just to clear your mind, but you're also you know, garnering a lot of data. And so I was um, on the road. Oh, shit. Did you know exercise is good for you? Seven o'clock. I, I didn't know that. Know today here in Miami, to, up to entrepreneurs, mm. a room of 3,000 entrepreneurs. I really enjoyed that. And here we are now sitting, talking about the same topic. So, you know, that routine is important, particularly around uh, mental wellness and physical wellness. And you've got to be, you got to, you know, you, I don't smoke. I don't take drugs. I drink wine. I like that. That's my one curse. It's bad for sleeping. I wear an aura rig. Mm. And I've done something else, which is a little unusual, but I, I learned it from a bunch of guys I'm involved in in longevity. I decided a couple of years ago to start wearing a glucose monitor, even though I'm not a diabetic, just to learn which foods spike my glucose. 
because every DNA is different. So I learned, for example, I mean, it's not really that different. I mean, we know which ones spike your glucose. They even have like a glycemic index on a lot of foods that will tell you which ones are going to spike your glucose. And I mean, as people get older, if they have a history of diabetes in their family, if they have money and <clears throat> good health yeah. insurance, uh, some doctors will, in fact, suggest that they uh, start early on the glucose monitor. Yeah, that's true. So. I love beer. You're trying to keep your glucose range between 50 and 150. Because there's a, it's not a theory anymore, it's a proven fact. If you spend your life spiking your glucose with sugar, your propensity to develop dementia, not Alzheimer, goes up geometrically. In fact, they've been able to arrest dementia by reducing- He likes that word geometrically. Heavy glucose loading. Yeah, they all, they all, they have, they all have these words that they like. That <clears throat> he, I think he means exponentially, right? Uh, it's a word that you can use interchangeably, but it's the same thing, yeah frying your brain with sugar. Mm. So if you understand that, you start saying, well, let's see what foods do that. Well, for me, it's beer. I go from, <laughs> you know, 88 to 280 after half a bottle of beer. You well, could have chosen true. something other than 88, friendo. Really dumb. Don't <laughs> do that to yourself. Or if you eat like a lot of watermelon, boom, through the roof, a lot of grapes. You, see, you, you end up finding foods that you're much stabler with in terms of this mandate to maintain the range. But what happens is you lose a ton of weight. You're not even hungry and you're just losing a ton of weight. And I lost 30 pounds and my energy level went up. Congrats. He uh, learned about the, uh, I lost, the low carb diet. I lost 30 pounds and my energy level went up. It sounds like an ad for a fucking fad diet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maintenance in a routine. So I cycle every day. I work out. I really watch what I eat. Mm. And my only sin is I love my wine. Yeah. How That's, do you look the same age? Like, I feel like forever. Like, yeah, ever yeah. since I first found out about it's you, called I money. How long ago it was, but you look exactly the same. You know, it, it's, I, I think, <laughs> and I, I was having this debate. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. two nights ago at a fundraiser, and I got that same question. My mother was half, Le but she was, she was Lebanese, and my father was Irish. If you look at Mediterranean people and their diets, you look at blue zones, they're all over the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Look at, you know, these islands off the coast of Greece or where I lived in Cyprus. People walk 40, mm -hmm. 50,000 steps a day. They eat two meals a day of salad and fish and olive oil and olives, and they don't eat any sugar in their bread. And I, I don't know that's the secret, but I've lived, remember, I grew up that way. That's all I knew living in Nicosia, Cyprus, mm -hmm. eating Lebanese food cooked by Lebanese women. That, I didn't appreciate it back then, but that diet's crazy healthy. Like th there's, you don't eat any shit. That's just not part of their culture. And so the same with the Italians, if you see, go uh, Yes, the, <clears throat> the Mediterraneans, uh, famous for never having invented baklava. <laughs> Like, get the fuck Italians, out of here. They're never, sweets. They make sweets. Yeah. Or Italians not known for inventing pasta or using it. Never. They didn't invent it. But. <laughs> right. I wish you, I wish you would like somebody in chat just said, I wish you would have said that thing that like uh, Brian Johnson said, where he's like, actually, I just have the, the blood of the young injected uh, into my bloodstream. <laughs> so works. much about what you put in your body every day. Now, look, if you want to take drugs, you want to smoke. You want to do all that crap? Well, oh, yes. You're going to look like shit. That's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So if you want to age out gracefully, think about what you put in your body and how you treat yourself. And the other thing, which sleep, get some sleep. <laughs> I wear an aura ring. I try for seven minutes, mm -hmm. 11, seven hours and 11 minutes of sleep. And I've learned one thing and I'll tell you right now. You got to stop drinking three hours before you go to bed. You just kill your REM. You kill your REM. You kill your sleep. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm I assume he means drinking day, uh, alcohol. 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 Drink during the week so that I have these great nights of sleep. And I think that just helps you for longevity. Good food for thought for everybody. And also, then the other thing about this is like, it's not that you have to stop drinking. It's like the, if you want to have a beer an hour before bed and you, that's your first beer, you're probably fine. It's that if you, if you've been, drinking you should try to stay up drink some water and chill out eat maybe eat some eat something light before bed so that you'll sleep better but yeah it, it's it's like one beer an hour or even a half an hour before you go to bed that's not going to do shit to you it's it's if yeah. you're intoxicated 
not only that, but if you've drank a lot of alcohol, you're likely to like get up a few times in the middle of the night to pee. You might get, you might have heartburn, uh, in, like indigestion. You might have, you know, you may have all these, you, you wake up uh, with the alcohol still in your stomach. You're not going to feel great the next morning because you're still a little drunk kind of like, get out of here. Yeah. Which is so inexpensive now. Aura rings are, this technology would have cost you a hundred grand 10 years. They were ago. a sponsor of our channel. I love the Aura Ring. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, the firmware updates are great. I wear it all the time. And I'm the always... firmware updates are great. That's what I love about my devices everything. is the firmware updates. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to, to, full disclosure, I do wear an Aura Ring myself, track sleep and other stuff. It's cool. Like I'm know. looking at my laptop right now, wondering why it's not alerting me about a firmware update. That's like how much <laughs> I love firmware updates. I'm never, never concerned that they're going to break my device or anything. Yeah. Everywhere. When I'm going between gigs, I zone out, hmm. get 10, 15, 20 minutes of sleep. Yeah. Where people say, oh, it's, it's, no, it's not valuable sleep. Every minute of yeah. sleep is valuable. It's funny you mentioned the diet. The U.S. diet is so terrible that uh, in January, I did uh, the caveman diet. So I just really- the keto? Uh, yeah, not keto, the caveman. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's just like just whole foods. It's kind of like paleo. Yeah, yeah. Just one ingredient food. So like chicken, rice, broccoli. Yeah, you got no to watch- food, gotta, no you gotta, He means food. Yeah. He you means know, like the not, way- Not the, high processed food, right? He means like the way that I eat when I cook. He's just, that's what he's talking sure. about. Maybe no yeah. rice. I eat a lot of rice now because I like make a lot of Indian food. But <clears throat> like, yeah, that was the the stuff on the, that was a dumbass chart. Yeah. The stuff on the left was uh, healthier. Yes. White yeah. rice. That's a very big spiker. You should move to uh, brown, brown rice. rice. Yeah, yeah, I do brown. Yeah. Uh, but my point being the first few weeks was actually really difficult because it was hard to find foods that were not processed, fried, or loaded with sugar. And when I got the diet down after about a week, and you had to be very careful about what you eat. Like going out to a restaurant, I had to be, I look Jack through, keeps like looking it. around like a crazy oh, person. I can't eat that. I can't eat that. Yeah, this, uh, his co-host doesn't seem that interested. I've seen him looking at the table several times. Maybe there's like an ant or like a fly or something on the table. I don't know. I don't he's, know if he's, if, I don't know if they have a crew or what. Um, actually running the video so he he might be like if they just set up cameras he might be checking out the cameras to make sure they're still working yeah that could be it that could be it but the the, the other guy does seem uh, disinterested and disengaged yeah he could co-host the intellectual dollar tree actually <laughs> that uh in the first few months though i lost 10 pounds yeah and it's just body fat and it's you all feel great right you get right. energy goes oh, up totally losing 10 pounds in a week is very bad for you Fat. Yes, but we screwed ourselves. That's way too much, but it's probably just water weight. Like, maybe years is we put too much sugar in our bread. We dose our bread with cane sugar, which is insane because it's the worst thing you can eat. Europe they do sourdough breads with no sugar, so when you eat a piece of bread here, you spike your glucose through the roof. I'm sure you really wanted Plain some, uh, you know, dietary advice from a really rich guy. So <clears throat> almost every bread recipe I've ever seen calls for a little bit of sugar. Yeah. You, it's my personal opinion is poison. It's, I wouldn't touch that shit. It's poison. I have to go out of my way here to find bakeries in Miami that make sourdough bread with no sugar. I don't want any sugar. I don't want any cane sugar. A lot of problems with cane sugar. There's too much of it. And slowly you'll see that the adoption of that kind of practice gets you in a much healthier place and reduces weight. But when you're in a restaurant, you're eating a loaf of bread or you know, and eating it before your meal comes, you're eating just cane sugar. It's mm. garbage. If you had to pick you don't eat the whole loaf of bread, but if they bring out a little <laughs> bit of bread and you dip it in some fucking olive oil, you don't eat the, you have like a piece or two. Would you pay right. go back 20 years? Oh, that's a great question. I would like to do that because I would have treated myself so much differently if I, if I could have done that. The way I, the, my lifestyle back then, the peak of you know being an operator, I was killing myself. Mm -hmm. I was just killing myself. I was working 21 hours a day, flying all over the world, not eating well. I weighed almost 40 pounds heavier. I wasn't sleeping at all. It was, and I think to myself now, why was I doing that to myself? What did that cost me? Like, it can't have been free. And so if I, if I could somehow... There would be the same guy who says you, you you should work twenty five hours a day, eight days a week. Right, he's contradicting himself now. Yeah, I don't know because I don't want to change anything in my life. I'm pretty happy with what I got right now. But if I could 
if I, if I, my advice to anybody in their twenties is think about what you're doing to yourself every day. If you kind of get hip to this, you'll live to 120 years old. And it'll be a really Very, nobody lives to 120. If you really think about exercise, that's like the diet. maximum amount. Like and, <laughs> right, not nobody, but I mean, it's it's a, a close enough. Like it's close enough to nobody. Right. Fair enough. Smoking. What are you, an idiot? I mean, I used yeah. to smoke, but that you have to be a complete moron to do that. That you have to be beyond moronic. You have you have to want to die in a horrible way. That is the worst thing you can do to your body. It's insane to inhale tobacco smoke. It's fucking crazy. But you know, 20, 30 percent of the population does it. Nuts. You gotta talk to Ben Mala. You gotta get him to quit. Do you know Ben Mala? Yeah. I mean, look, it, it's it, it's it's so, yeah, I bump cigarettes off them all the time. It's a dramatic change when you pick it. <laughs> Within 90 days, you start to feel different. You start mm -hmm. tasting things. Everybody I've talked to that's pulled it off. You got to take anything you can to stop yourself from smoking. How much would you pay, though, to go back 20 years? Now, let's just say everything is the same. It's just you today, right here, right now. Nothing has changed, but you're 20 years younger. Yeah, it's priceless. I mean, there is no... There, I'd pay any amount, but can't do it. That's That's been... Yeah. Anybody would want to do that because... But it's it's... I, the only way that deal makes sense is if I get to keep the knowledge I have today. You do. Okay. You would give everything. Okay. That, that, if I, well, if then I, you could just win the lottery all the time. If I could keep my portfolio, because yeah. that's, you know, <laughs> your portfolio, I'm keeping <laughs> the portfolio. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> but, but that's I've stupid got. because the, the, a lot of the stuff you're invested in right now didn't exist 20 years ago. Yep. Work hard for this stuff, so I've got it now. <laughs> uh, I don't want to lose any houses or anything like that. I want to keep okay. my planes, all the that guitars, stuff. watches. I want all of that. <laughs> like, I want everything. It's all coming back with me. This band probably I could sucks. Get back for years. Um, yeah, that would be. Of course, that that is that's priceless. If anybody ever develops that techno technology, he'll be the most successful entrepreneur on earth. I'm curious for. People that do self-sabotaging behavior like smoking and drinking and eating bad food and stuff like that. Do you think that they're just kind of born into that and they just for some reason have like a biological predisposition to not really think about things critically and how things may impact them future in, in the future? Or hey, do you Dave, think do you think he's going to solve all the uh, issues of really the, the addiction and uh, personal problems? Maybe. Affects their, their <laughs> yeah. brain into that self sabotaging. I think the food thing um, is because they were brought up on a very high glucose diet, a high sugar diet, a high. Because um, if you think about people in Europe, you look at France or um, Italy or the Middle East, they don't have that propensity to overeat because they were never. And even even alcoholism in places like France, where they introduce wine into children's diets at the age of eleven, many Europeans don't even drink at night. They drink during their their main meal at lunch um, because they like to sleep better, not because they know. I, they just, I, yes, Europe look, famous for not having any nightclubs. Look at the European <laughs> style of the big meals at lunch, mm. and then there's a small repast in, in the evening, much healthier. I think it's the way we've. Our culture has probably made a mistake. The Japanese also, look at the way they eat. I mean, they do a phenomenal job. They eat lots of protein there. I, I visit Japan all the time. We have uh, gone offside in our culture in terms of how we we actually uh, develop that, that, that culture in terms of eating and being obsessed with food and eating the wrong food. But no one's perfect. I mean, if, if I were really on message and if I was really, you know, going to my own mandate about what I eat, I, I wouldn't drink anything. I'd stop drinking alcohol. I should, but I don't. So that's my one crutch. <clears throat> so but I if you just have like a health. glass of wine or two a couple times a week, you're you're fine, baby. Nothing. There are yeah. even <clears throat> there, are, and this is probably you know not necessarily. There are even some indications that it's it might be good for you. I don't know. Like there's a problem with those studies where they they say such and such is good for you, and maybe in moderation. Like they're always. They've always been paid for by the industry, right? Right. Uh, and and of course, they're going to push that and make it sound like it's a, a big deal. But um, I haven't looked at the studies. I don't know. I would take that with a grain of salt. Right. But <clears throat> if you're doing a if you're not overdoing it, it's probably not a big deal. Right. I probably drink too much. But that's. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it's, no, it's I not. It's I mean, it, 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 it would be fine for you to say, I don't give a fuck. I'm, I'm like, I'm like not unaware of myself. Right. Right. No, I'm kidding. I, I don't know how much you, you drink actually. <laughs> I, you, I would, you're I would not I, drinking when I would not want to just have a glass of wine with this guy, but it'd be fun to go on a bender with him. He might buy me a fucking Maserati. How much I do it and when I do it. Or a hundred thousand dollar watch. How often is it during a shark tank pitch that it's not the product or service at all and everything the person's personality that completely ruins it? Although you know what, really quick, if you're building another ad. You know what, really quick? We're gonna go ahead and put the fork in this part the podcast right. part of the show because it's uh we try to keep it under an hour and a half and because I have to pee. Um so right. that's <clears throat> that was this. Um I don't know, I don't I sometimes watch the rest of what we started watching uh, during the post game. This will not be one of those times. I hate this man. <laughs> I hate this man. And I'm learning to hate the iced coffee hour guys too, but I'm, I'm just learning, just, just learning how to hate, how to hate them. Not quite there. Yeah. Uh, do you, <clears throat> you were the one who turned me on to the iced coffee hour guys. Um, <clears throat> why, how did you find them? Well, I used to to watch the Graham Steph Stephan show. The Graham Stephan was one of the uh, guys who was doing the interviewing. And um, then he started doing this. So it's called the Ice Coffee Hour because Graham actually like tried to start like a, a, a coffee uh, company. And so he was doing all sorts of like coffee branded stuff. I don't, I don't know if they still do it or what happened. Um, but he was like, his coffee was supposed to be cheap, like iced coffee that you could uh, make yourself or something. Um, but that's where the name came, come, came from. I started watching it. I would say there are other interviews that are better, you know, um, I've, I've been kind of interested in some of them they, they've had recently, but, uh, I knew this one and the ones that I send you tend to be really out there. I, I knew this one would be a good one for IGT. So we watched the one that I, uh, that I enjoyed the most that I watched actually was with pharma bro. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it was primarily because they made fun of him a little bit. Yeah. Which is surprising. They usually don't like they, they do the thing where, uh, they just ask questions and, uh, let the other person talk a lot. Uh, they don't challenge anybody, even though they have guests that they really should challenge. Um, I, they, they challenged Ben Shapiro a little bit when we watched oh, okay. with Ben Shapiro, but my, my guess based on what I've seen from them is that they're like libs, right? They're not leftists but they're not conservative right they're like right. libs and um i don't know i think like i don't i would never want to hang out with them um they would probably be fucking insufferable but i would rather yeah. hang out with them than the guests they had this time <laughs> yeah probably so yeah i guess that's the show um usually i make hk read it out i'm not gonna make you read out the show because you have probably no idea what to say but i don't read this show out ever, ever either so i probably have no idea what to say <laughs> but thanks everybody for watching the intellectual dollar tree the show's live on twitch every wednesday 7 p.m pacific uh wednesday usually goes pretty late with the post game if you're interested in what happens in the post game uh, there are ways to get it for free just by going to twitch and figuring that out or you can uh, go to eplex.store or patreon.com slash ecoplex sign up at the five dollar level or higher i'm going to I have to pee i'm going to uh, change the color of the lights in my studio and uh unlike that man's unlike the advice the man gave i'm also going to change the contents of my beverage uh this is boomers by periscope and uh i'll see everyone in the post game matt thanks for co-hosting you're welcome see you later
your pay.